Daniel chapter number six. Daniel chapter number six. We'll continue on in our study in the book of Daniel uh, here on Sunday evenings uh, in our church. Daniel chapter number six, and we're going to look at Daniel uh, once again as 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 the man Daniel uh, to be an example for us about what it means to be steadfast in the faith. Uh, Daniel certainly is a good example of that. Uh, that we can look to and, and we could follow. So uh, Daniel chapter 6 and beginning with verse number 1, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom and 120 princes which should be over the whole kingdom. And over these three presidents of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them and the king should have no damage. Uh, then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault for as much as he was faithful. Neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Then these presidents and princes assembled uh, together to, uh, to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the reading of the Word of God this evening, and thank you again for allowing us the privilege to be able to be gathered together uh, here in your house on the Lord's Day for this, our evening service. We ask now that you would speak to our hearts through the preaching of your Word and by the presence of your Holy Spirit, and draw us closer to yourself. Lord, our desire is to learn more of you and to be better equipped to serve you. Lord, help us to look at the example uh, that we have here in the Holy Scriptures of this man, Daniel, an example of one that was truly steadfast in, in his faith and his service to you. Lord, we would like to be that kind of Christian, steadfast in faith. Uh, Lord, committed to uh, serving you in, in every area of our lives. Help us to do that. Lord, as always, we would pray for souls to be saved and lives to be changed and for revival to come. And we'll thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen and amen. Thank you. You may uh, be seated. Now, in our study of the book of Daniel, there, there's some things that, that we know about Daniel that we can, uh, that we can learn some things that, that you can learn from uh, reading the text yourself. And of course, there's some good commentaries out there. There's a lot of writings from various Bible commentators and, and so forth all through the years uh, on the book of Daniel. Uh, we know that Daniel lived under the reign of three different kings, you know, starting out there in Babylon with uh, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, then there was Belshazzar, and uh, with the uh, uh, and then Darius here with the Medes and the Persians. So three different kings that we know about. And, and we can understand that Daniel at this time that we're reading about here in Daniel chapter 6, he was probably about 85 years old now at, at, at this point. Now it started out, uh, we feel like he would have been probably a teenager. Uh, in Daniel chapter number 1, a part of that first group of captives uh, from Jerusalem that Nebuchadnezzar uh, had taken into Babylon. And, uh, but now he's, uh, he's an, uh, an older man and uh, probably about 85 years old, we can understand. Uh, he's experienced many severe trials and temptations, but he has remained faithful, faithful to his own conscience and faithful to his God. Now, he started out, as we said, as a young man of faith there in Daniel chapter 1. And I think a real key to that is what it tells us in Daniel chapter 1, verse number 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. There's a key right there. There's a key to understanding the kind of man uh, that Daniel was. And, and a wonderful thing about it is we see Daniel here in chapter 6 now. Uh, now he's, uh, he, he's an, an old man, and, and yet he had this purpose that he made in his heart back when he was a young man, evidently, boy, he's kept that purpose because we still see him steadfast in faith uh, here in Daniel chapter number six. And he lived a life of faith and purpose and continued to do so even into his old age. And this just proves something for us. And I, and I trust that, that I can get an amen right here. And that is that it proves that age is no barrier to serving the Lord. Amen. amen. Age is no barrier to serving the Lord. Daniel was a man who is steadfast in the faith and he certainly is a good example for us as well. In fact, that word steadfast uh, that we're using here uh, is a word that means to endure patiently, to endure patiently. And so a steadfast person is one who is reliable, uh, one, someone that you count on, uh, one that is faithful, one that is true to the end. And you know, Daniel's a good example of this, but let me give you another example. I think our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is a good example of, of a man uh, that was steadfast. And Jesus certainly was steadfast, uh, reliable, faithful, and true to the end concerning his uh, mission upon the earth. In Luke chapter number 9, uh, Luke chapter 9, I'm going to read a few verses there. In fact, quite a few verses beginning with verse number uh, 51. Luke chapter 9 and verse number uh, 51. And this, you may remember this, uh, beginning with, uh, verse 51, and it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly, there's that word there, steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Now it talks about the time has come that he should be received up. That is, it's, it's close to the time of, of Calvary, uh, close to the time of his crucifixion on the cross. He steadfastly set his face. He's going to Jerusalem. Nothing was going to uh, detour him. Nothing was going to uh, remove him from that mission. He knew what he was facing. He told his disciples uh, before that, uh, that he would be put to death, that he would be mocked, that he'd be uh, spit upon, that he'd be crucified, that he'd put, be put to death there in Jerusalem. He had told his disciples this. He knew exactly what, he was, uh, what was in store for him, but yet he steadfastly had set his face to go there. there that's... That's determination. That's steadfastness. It goes on, says uh, uh, Luke 9, verse 52, and, and sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? 
But he turned and rebuked them and said, uh, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but save them. And they went to another village. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, uh, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my, my father. And Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury the dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which were at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Daniel is the picture of a man that, that put his hand to the plow and refused to look back. Amen. He was steadfast about his uh, purpose uh, of, of serving God. Jesus was steadfast, uh, put his hand to the plow, would not turn back, uh, would stay committed to the task and the mission uh, that, that the Father had given him. Over in Luke chapter number 18, uh, Luke chapter 18, and reading just a little bit, verse 31 uh, and, and following, it says, uh, Luke 18, verse 31, Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished, for he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on, and they shall scourge him and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. And they understood none of these things, and this saying was hid from them, neither knew they uh, the things which were spoken. And so Jesus told his disciples what would be taking place uh, on his way to Jerusalem. They didn't catch it, they didn't understand it, and we, and we know that from our study of the Gospels. They began to really start understanding some things after his death and then after his resurrection that kind of sealed the things. You remember reading some of the things in the Gospels, how that they would refer back to when he told us this. And, uh, and now they've seen it you know, come to, uh, come to pass. But Jesus is, a, is an example of one who is steadfast about his mission on the earth. Daniel is an example of one who is steadfast. The Apostle Paul, uh, he commended the Thessalonians. Uh, you remember this? Uh, he commended the Thessalonians for uh, their uh, steadfastness in the faith. In uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and if you remember uh, verse 1, uh, going down through, uh, through verse number 4, Look at this. Well, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, in particular, verse 3 and verse 4. Let's read verse 1 and verse 2 together with it as Paul begins this second letter to the Thessalonians. Paul and Silvanus and, and, and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is me, uh, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves grow in uh, glory in you in the churches of God. And listen to this. For your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. The Thessalonian believers were enduring persecutions and enduring uh, tribulations. And Paul commends them about, uh, uh, about their patience and their faith in the midst of these persecutions and tribulations. And, and so he commends them for their steadfastness, you see. Uh, steadfastness, the word patience, uh, carries that meaning of one that is steadfast, one that is reliable and faithful and true to the end. James uh, tells us that trials uh, that test our faith uh, will produce steadfastness in our lives and patience and faithfulness in our lives. In James chapter 1, verse 3, he said, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And so steadfastness, the example that we're seeking to see in Daniel here, it means to endure. It means to persevere. It means to keep on keeping on. Amen. And truly, that's what our heart's desire would be to do, amen, to keep on keeping on in living for the Lord and serving Him, even in the midst uh, when our faith can be on trial 
And we're living in a generation where that only not only is a possibility, but that very, uh, very well is something that will be likely to happen. Uh, in our in our time in these coming uh, perhaps even these coming few years and so how can we be steadfast in the faith like Daniel well notice some things about him here in Daniel chapter number six. First of all we see Daniel's devotion Daniel's devotion I believe you can can really uh, read that in verse one down through verse number five it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom. 120 princes, which should be uh, over the whole kingdom, and over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, and the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. Uh, then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault for as much as he was faithful. Now those two things it says about him. One, in verse three, there he had an excellent spirit. In verse number four, uh, he was faithful. Neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Here we see Daniel's devotion is really on display here in the way that it is described uh, in these verses. We know that Daniel began each day with prayer and devotion before the Lord. If you look over to verse number 10, how it tells us in verse 10 that he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Now this decree had gone out that no one was to do that. If anyone was caught doing that, that is making any kind of prayer or request or so forth to, to any, any God or anyone else other than that King Darius, they'd be uh, cast into the, into the lion's den. It, said, it tells us there that Daniel knew this. He knew all about it, but yet he, he would kneel down uh, three times a day. He would pray. He would give thanks before his God. And, and here's the key. As, as he did four times. This is what he always did, uh, three times a day. Devotion was not an incidental thing in Daniel's life. It was the essential ingredient in Daniel's life. It really was the thing that we should recognize that, that really made the difference. Now, in chapter 1, he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself, so that was his purpose. But what was it that enabled him to uh, complete his purpose? that enabled him from as a young man, now as an old man, to remain steadfast in the faith. I'd say it was his devotion. It was his devotion before uh, the Lord. Uh, his devotion uh, to the Lord is what made his life. He had a place for prayer and a time for devotion. And you can be sure that he talked to the Lord uh, uh, many times all throughout the day. Now look with me at Psalm 55. Uh, Psalm 55, there's two verses that you ought to take note of, and maybe, maybe if you haven't marked it or underlined it in your Bible, it's two good verses uh, for, for us to remember. In Psalm 55, this uh, Psalm of David uh, tells us in the title that it's a masculine and and uh, you remember when we studied the masculine psalm, so it's been uh, quite a while ago now, the word masculine in Hebrew is the word for instruction. And so these are psalms for instruction. There's 13 of them. And so we get instruction here. But in verse 16 and verse 17, uh, he writes this, As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. Dan it says of Daniel that, that he uh, got on his knees and he prayed three times a day. And it, it was, it's obvious from the text in Daniel chapter 6 that that was the normal thing that he did every day. Uh, it, was his, it was his time of devotion. And here David says, evening and morning and noon, I will pray and cry aloud and, uh, and he shall hear my voice. I, I think that we could learn from this both from David and then from Daniel as well. But, but I think especially from David here in Psalm 55, it really is especially important for us to begin each day with prayer and devotion before the Lord. Can you say amen to that? It's, it's, it's good to end the day uh, as well, 
But it's important to start the day that way. I think especially uh, in our prayer closets and one-on-one, -on -one, uh, by ourselves, each one of us uh, with, uh, with the Lord in a time of, of devotion and prayer. Bible reading, devotion and prayer. Psalm 63, verse 1. O God, Thou art my God, early will I seek Thee. And that can refer to early in your life. It's good to try to encourage our children, even at a very young age, even at a very early age, just really as soon as they can understand, we should, we should really try to help our children and our grandchildren and so forth see the need of seeking God, of seeking after the Lord. Oh God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. And there's a lot of examples in the Bible, in the Old Testament, of, of young people that would seek the Lord or early in their lives. And, uh, but also it can be uh, applied to early in the day early in the morning before we get started with anything else and, and our minds get cluttered with other things early will i seek thee psalm fit uh, or psalm 5 rather psalm 5 and verse number three my voice shalt thou hear in the morning O lord in the morning will i direct my prayer unto thee and will look up and so it's early in the morning you know we have the example in the in the gospels of jesus himself uh, the Bible describing how that he would arise early before, before the sun would come up and he would go and be alone and, and would uh, spend time in prayer uh, to the Father. And so you've got Daniel's devotion here and, and a couple of things that stand out about this. I think one is the integrity of his character in verse number five, the integrity of his character, Daniel chapter six, verse five. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against Daniel except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Now, now it, it just, it's just made known to us here in the scripture that these other men, uh, they, they were doing this for the very purpose. Uh, they, weren't, they weren't coming up with this thing to do in order to please the king, uh, Darius. They wanted to catch Daniel. They were jealous of Daniel. And they wanted to get him in trouble. Daniel's enemies are witnesses to the purity of his life. Uh, as a man of prayer and faith, he was faultless. And so the only thing they could think to accuse Daniel of was his undivided devotion to the Lord. They wanted that king to think that, that, that everyone needed to be totally devoted to him, you know, as the king. But no, Daniel was totally devoted to the Lord. And the greatest test, I think an application to be made for us, is that the greatest test of the Christian is, is not the unexpected trial that comes upon us and how we react to that, but the simple routine of daily life. Amen. How do you live your life on a daily basis? How, is your, the integrity of your character Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, Jesus said this, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Are our hearts pure on a daily basis? Uh, the integrity of his character there. But then also the intensity of his devotion. You see that in verse number 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did a fourth time. Now, now watch this. Daniel knew that his enemies had, su had succeeded in setting a trap for him. Uh, he knew that he helped us. Well, you know, he could have had his devotion. He could have had his prayer with the, with the windows closed. And I'm sure the Lord would have been fine with that. Uh, we, I think we could suppose that. But Daniel opened the windows anyway. I think he knew they were, they were going to be watching him. Uh, he, he knew, he understood they'd already been watching him. Uh, but he just trusted God and he continued on. And here's the key. It wasn't that he was just seeking to put on a display like a in-your-face kind of thing you know, to his enemies. Daniel was just doing what he always did. That's all it was. He was just committed to the Lord to just do what he always did. The circumstances had no effect in changing his holy purpose to be true to God. Reminds me of what the writer of the first psalm uh, says. And this is a wonderful example in, of a life that we should desire for our own lives. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, 
nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. I say there's a good picture of Daniel right there. It really is a good picture of Daniel. And it's a good picture of what the desire that we should have for our own lives ought to be. And so with Daniel in his devotion, the intensity of his devotion and the integrity of his character. But then just the second thing that we see about him in Daniel chapter uh, number six as a good example of being steadfast in the faith. You see, the, you see Daniel's enemies here and the enemy's deception. The enemy's deception from verse 3, really, really reading all the way down through uh, verse number 9. Now, now you see that, that God honored Daniel for his, his faithfulness. He was practically the second ruler. Uh, it says in verse 3 that this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. And so he was practically the second ruler. He was above uh, these three presidents who were above these 20 princes. And it really sounds like uh, Darius had the idea. He's setting this thing up. So, uh, uh, so he just have it made. He just let these others take care of things and, and uh, he wouldn't have to worry about it. And he had such a trust in Daniel that he was, going, he was just going to put Daniel over the whole thing. And he was just going to go enjoy himself. He would just have that title. Uh, he'd, have the, he'd have that privilege of having that title as the king, but as of having to run the country, he was going to leave it, leave it to Daniel. And so these uh, enemies of Daniel, uh, they, were, uh, they, they were jealous, I think, of all of this. God honored Daniel for his faithfulness. Uh, and, and the promotion of Daniel really is proof that a believer does not have to compromise his standards in order to succeed in this world. You say amen to that? A lot of folks in our world today that think, well, you've got to compromise here or there uh, to be able to get anywhere. No, God can still bless you. Amen. You don't have to compromise your standards. Uh, you don't have to give in to things of the world to try to have any kind of success or prosperity in this life. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, the Bible says this, in fact, Jesus said this, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And so what things is that? Well, food, clothing, the things that you need in your life, everything that you need. He says, look, if you just seek God and his kingdom first, God's going to take care of you, Amen. You don't have to compromise your standards to have success and to have some prosperity in this life. Now, these other leaders were not happy about Daniel's success and, uh, and, and about his promotion in the kingdom, and so they plotted against him. Notice verse 4 and verse 5. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. They said, look, as far as, as, far as doing the job, as far as being uh, the president, as far as uh, taking care of the, of the government, as far as doing his job for Darius the king so that the king can just relax and, and enjoy himself and the title and the prestige that he had and let, and let Daniel just take care of everything. As far as, far as that goes, uh, 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 Daniel, they, they, they would say that they could find nothing at fault. They would try to find where he messed up, maybe where he was... Uh, uh, doing something funny with, with the finances, with the books or something, uh, you know, juggling the books, I think's the way they call it. Uh, they could find him doing this or that, but they couldn't find anything. Daniel was true to his service to Darius and to the job that he had been given uh, to do. They couldn't find any occasion, any fault in him at all. They said, the only thing we're going to find is, is how, he, how he serves God, how he loves God. And so that's what they did. They, they sought to plot against him because of his devotion 
and his steadfastness in the faith in serving the Lord. You know, the thing about it is, that's the way it will be for us. And I think that's the way it will be for us in these last days, this generation that we're living in now. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter number 3, and, and if you remember the beginning uh, there, verse 1 down through verse number 4, the Apostle Paul said this, uh, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And I tell you what, that one statement there is, is, a, is, a, is, an, is an accurate description, perhaps above anything, of this generation that you and I find ourselves in the midst of now. Everything is about pleasure. Everything is about uh, doing what, what feels good to you. And it's promoted in every way in our, in our society today. But in, in verse number 12 of 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul tells Timothy, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And he goes on, verse 13, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And so that's the generation we're living in now. That's the time. That's a description of it. That is what is happening. And so we're living in a generation where evil is waxing worse and worse. Where if you desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, you're going to be persecuted. Uh, it's not a matter of if it'll happen. It's really just a matter of, of when or where it will happen. You know, the thing about this, let's be honest with ourselves. If we, were, if we ourselves here at Grace Baptist Church... If we lived somewhere else, in our nation even, if we lived perhaps in some place like California or like New York City or like some other place like that, by looking at some of the things that are happening on the world, the kind of, the kind of uh, 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 standards that we have here, the kind of lives that we would seek to live here, uh, the, the way that we try to present ourselves, I, I like to think that the way we preach the Bible here uh, in, in other places, uh, we would have already been suffering some tribulations and persecutions. There would have already been some that would be trying to shut us down. There'll be those that would try to shut us up and they don't want us to preach like we do. They don't want us to live like we do. They don't want us to uh, have the, the testimony that we do. We would already be suffering persecution even right now uh, were it not for you know, the place that God has allowed us to live. But that doesn't mean it's not going to come here. Uh, it still can come here because evil men and seducers are going to wax worse and worse. But Paul told Timothy this one thing. I'm looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And he's talking about how that Timothy learned from Paul himself. Paul is a mentor to young, the young preacher Timothy. He said, you've learned it from me. You just keep on keeping on. You just keep on doing as you have learned. Keep on preaching the word of God. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect through the furnace and all good works. And so then in chapter four, he said this, preach the word, amen. He says, Timothy, this is what we're going to be facing. There's going to be perilous times. Men will be lovers of their own selves. They'll be covetous. They'll be boasters. They'll be proud. Uh, they'll be blasphemers. They'll be all of these things. They'll be un unthankful, unholy. They'll be without natural affection. You and I know that's going on today. So much that is going on in our world today. Hey, you don't even have to have your television on very long. And, and, and they're putting up commercials now. Uh, with the with the homosexuals, the men huddled up against each other, and and, and all these things, 
I, I, and I'm here to tell you tonight, uh, church, that is not natural. That is without natural affection. Uh, the Bible tells us that it's an abomination before the Lord. And it's not natural. It's not natural for, for a girl or a woman to try to look and act like a man. It's not natural for a boy or a man to try to look and act like, like a girl. And, and, and we're living in that world today. Uh, it's, just, it's just not natural. Not natural uh, uh, affection. Uh, without natural affection. And it goes on in the other things. Uh, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And even in churches, it says in verse 5 in 2 Timothy chapter 3, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Folks, that's our world that we're living in today. And so here, here let me give you something else. Uh, 1 Peter uh, uh, chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. You know, the thing about it is, well, he goes on and says, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Let none of you, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at, at the house of God. Those are the days we're living in, uh, very soon to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, the thing is, if we will be steadfast, if we will not compromise, if we will uh, keep our focus, if we would be like Daniel and purpose in our hearts that we will not defile ourselves, and if, and if we'll keep ourselves in, in, in the integrity of our character and the intensity of our devotion and have a life like Daniel, then when the Lord Jesus Christ does return, <laughs> we'll cer we certainly will not be ashamed at his coming but we'll also, at that time, we'll be glad for the suffering that we did go through. Amen. We'll be glad to have suffered on his behalf. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, how we handle the trials can be determined by the quality of our devotion to the Lord. And in verse 3 in Daniel 6, again, this one other thing that I'll close with this, it says that there is an excellent spirit was in him. An excellent spirit was in him. And, and so let me suggest to you this. He had an excellent spirit. He, he had a, an excellent character. Excellent integrity. He had an excellent spirit because he had an excellent devotion to his God. His devotion was what it was all about. Daniel would, would pray three times a day before the Lord. I think he followed the uh, admonition of David uh, morning and noon and evening and he would pray and he would seek the Lord. And, and, and you and I can do that. Amen. We can easily do that. We can do that. He, he was certainly steadfast in faith and you and I can be the same. And, and I would suggest to us also that in this day that we're living in, we need to do the same. Amen? We need to do the same. We need that excellent spirit. We need that, that faithful devotion uh, to the Lord. We, the, we need to have the Lord see that in us. And when we do face the trial and we do face the persecution and the Lord does come, uh, then we'll be so glad that we kept the faith, that we stayed true, uh, even through such a generation and such a time as we're living in right now. Amen? Amen. Daniel is a good example for us. You've heard it said like this. I'll say it again. We just need to dare to be a Daniel. We just need to be like him. You know, be, be like that. And of course, we want to be like our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Daniel is a good example for us to follow that helps us to do that. Amen.
Amen. Let's go ahead and stand together, our heads bowed and our eyes uh, closed for prayer. And let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the word of God and thank you for this example of Daniel uh, this evening. Lord, thank you for allowing us to be at your house to, to study your word. And Lord, would you help us by your Holy Spirit to have a, a, a devotion and a devotional life like Daniel had, uh, to be that committed that, that in, in all areas of life, no one can find any fault in us. And Lord, that they can, and then in everything, uh, if they would find any fault against us, they would fault us for being so devoted uh, to you, Lord, because we know the world is against that devotion. That they would see us so devoted to you, Lord, uh, that this world would be against us. Lord, we know that we're living in these last days. Persecution and trials are, are sure to come. Lord, help us by thy spirit and by your word to be steadfast in our faith, in our devotion before you. Help us to remember uh, Daniel. Help us to remember, Lord Jesus, how you were so steadfast and focused to go to the cross uh, and take our place there at Calvary uh, on our behalf. Lord, help us remember these examples and apply them to our lives. And Lord, we'll thank you. We pray you forgive us when we do fail you because we are still frail and we still have this flesh that, 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 that we contend with. But Lord, our desire is to be faithful and to be steadfast. And so Lord, with your help, that is what we will seek to do, live such a life as we've seen in our study this evening. And it's in Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen and amen. Well, let's sing a song together, Brother Tim, if you're ready. Page 97.